Back to the Future is one of my first exposures to what's considered a trilogy when it comes to the movies. I always remember being a kid around Christmas in 1989 and my mom taking me to the movies to see Back to the Future 2, which everyone was buzzing about because of how beloved the first movie was and how cool all of the actual future stuff looked in the trailers. And yes, I do feel quite old knowing that future was nine years ago. Thank you. But then something weird happened. We get to the end of the movie, which of course stops on a cliffhanger, and a message is displayed up on the screen advertising that Back to the Future 3 is coming out next summer. I was amazed, as I hadn't seen anything like that at the movies before. I mean, advertising the next movie while you're watching the current one? That just seemed crazy. But it worked, and as soon as Back to the Future 3 hit theaters about six months later, I was back to see how the story would finish. Now, don't get me wrong, I had seen other movies that were part of a trilogy at that point. Star Wars, Indiana Jones, and Rocky, to name a few. But in all those series, and I'm sure I'll get some arguments about this, the movies aren't really that well connected, at least not directly, and they tend to stand on their own. Hell, in the Indiana Jones movies, the only real constant is Indy himself, or should I say Junior, because as we all know, Indiana was the dog. Anyway, with Back to the Future, all three movies directly tie to one another, as the end of one is the beginning of the next. This neatness, for lack of a better term, for how well connected the movies are, is part of the charm of the franchise, and also one of the reasons why that, so far, there hasn't been an attempt at the dreaded remake, because it would have to hit such a high bar to really pull it off properly in comparison to what came before. However, I should probably pause for a second because I'm sure that there's some of you out there that don't know me and are confused because you only came here to see me complain about how terrible Back to the Future 3 for the Genesis is and not get some TED talk about movie theory. Be patient, it'll come in time. Hi, my name is Dave and welcome to Zalagamoto, the channel where, listen, if I'm going to review a bad game, you have to allow me to go off script a little bit. It's too miserable otherwise. Anyway, I'm out to collect and review the nearly 1,280 titles released in the English language for the Sega Master System, Genesis slash Mega Drive, Sega or Mega CD as the case may be, and finally the 32X. Basically, if I can plug it into a Genesis either by itself or with some sort of add-on and be able to read what's up on the screen, I'm trying to get a copy of it and review it for posterity with both looks at that original packaging and gameplay captured from original hardware whenever possible. Now, you might be wondering, well, Dave, how do you know that this game is bad? You haven't reviewed it yet. Did future you come back and try to warn you before reviewing it? And actually, now that I think about it, that would have been a pretty good gag for setting up this video if I had things like a budget or free time. Uh, but no, actually, I suppose I am technically being a bit hasty with that comment. You see, back in episode 153, I reviewed the Master System version of this game, and that's probably prejudicing me a bit against this version. And to be fair, I didn't hate the Master System version, but it was flawed and short, resulting in a one-star rating. There's one key here, and that's the Master System version wasn't the original version of the game. It was a port, and this, the Genesis version, is where the game actually started. So just like with this being the original version of Back to the Future 3, I need to put aside any preconceived notions and give this game a fresh look. But before we do all that, let's take a look at the somewhat hard to find package. And here's my copy of Back to the Future 3 for the Genesis. This copy is in really good shape. Not perfect, as you can see the hang tab was removed, but other than that, the outer and inner covers are nearly flawless. No scratching or tearing on the outside, and no sun bleaching or water damage to the inside. The manual and cart labels are nearly perfect as well, as you'll see when we open it up. I hinted that the game is somewhat hard to find, and due to that, I'm ecstatic that I have a copy that's in this condition. And to be clear, the game is out there. If you want a copy, an eBay search when researching this video came up with 33 hits, and a copy of the Master System version of Shadow of the Beast for some reason. But it's not cheap, especially if you want a complete copy with the manual. For that, expect to spend at least $100, if not more, depending on what's listed on eBay right then, as the prices have actually come down over the last few years. 
As far as the front cover art goes, this is hard to complain about and near perfect as it's basically just the movie poster slightly reformatted and with some additional branding down at the bottom. This was already a great poster, so definitely no reason to try to reinvent the wheel here. It shouldn't be that surprising that there was no Japanese version of the game, but there was a European version from Imageworks who handled all the European versions of the game, and it's pretty similar with just some slightly different coloring and that amazing looking Imageworks logo. Good work, guys. Although I suppose, at very least, even with that logo, it's better than the Brazilian Tech Toy version, and, well, uh, the less said about that, the better. In fact, yeah, let's get that off screen. Ick. Flipping over to the rear cover, and, well, hmm, my, my BS detector is going off a bit here. Those screenshots are ever so slightly fuzzy, but for the most part, they look pretty good. They make the game look really colorful, and by showcasing one of each of the different levels, it makes the game seem like it's got a lot going on for it with all the different variety between the scenes. But I don't know, I just have a feeling that something isn't right here. Maybe future me did tip me off somehow, who knows. Aside from the screenshots though, the text is pretty solid and this is a clean layout. Each of the captions is good, and I appreciate that final one. Climb aboard, Doc train, and fight your way. Dun dun dun. Back to the future. It's cheesy, but I like that they went for it. There's one thing that I've got to call out as a possible concern, and that's the magazine quote over on the side, where they went with a quote from GamePro, complete with crediting the writer's obvious pseudonym. You may remember a few episodes ago when GamePro was caught giving the Make My Video Sega CD games a near-perfect score. So suffice it to say, if you're using a quote from that magazine to try to sell your game, I'm immediately suspicious. And come on, attributing a quote to Hollywood? Really, guys? You know, I almost want to see what would happen when a professional magazine review channel... Nah, you know what, we already did that gag. Plus, I don't hate anyone enough to make them read GamePro. Opening up the package, and the manual appears almost untouched. Not that there is much to touch, as the documentation is clearly a bit on the skimpy side, with a grand total of nine pages here, including the traditional one to turn on the console. The manual appears to do its job and explains how to play the game, covering the individual controls used in each level, and there's even sections to give backgrounds to the story behind the levels that do their best to tie the game to the movie. However, I say appears to do its job, though, because there's a pretty major omission as far as the first level specifically is concerned that could potentially make what's already a difficult experience even worse. I'll get more into that when I discuss that level in the review section, but it's a major unforced error on Arena's part, to be sure. Okay, that's the package. Let's brave the Wild West once again and try to make it to the second level without using the level skip code. Before we get into the game and start discussing that infamous first level, I think we have to deal with another elephant in the room that you'll probably be able to see relatively quickly on screen, especially once the actual gameplay starts. If you're wondering if I messed with these scanline filters again on the RetroTink, no, I haven't, and honestly, it's such a great device that with minimal configuration, I was able to settle on an output that I really liked. But you're on the right track by thinking that there's something wrong with the graphics. You see, it turns out that Probe made a bit of an oopsie when finalizing the code for the game, and they ended up using the wrong color palette, with the shadow version of the palette accidentally being used instead of the normal one due to a programming error. This is why I was calling out the screenshots on the back of the package, because those must have come from a different pre-production version of the game that didn't have the graphics bug. While this is a glaringly obvious error to anyone that actually, you know, put the game in a console and tried playing it, which of course raises the question of how the hell this wasn't caught in testing before they went to production, believe it or not, it's not the only time that we've seen it happen on the channel. Back in episode 127, I looked at The Secret of Monkey Island for Sega CD, and at first, I thought I was having weird capture errors when trying to record gameplay. I did a few different things, like try different video cables and adjust the brightness in the game capture software, but something just wasn't right. 
After doing some googling, I found that Monkey Island had the same problem of using the shadow version of the palette instead of the normal one, causing the graphical issues. So I suppose if a pretty high profile Sega CD port like The Secret of Monkey Island could run into this issue, it makes sense that it could happen to someone else. But I think it's pretty telling that there's a patch out there to fix that game, but not Back to the Future 3. Once you get past the darkness issue, which honestly looks worse in capture than it does when actually playing the game, it's now time to get into the other issue I mentioned in the package section, and that's the manual failing to properly explain how to play the first level of the game. The first level of the game, which is designed to replicate the sequence of Doc Brown riding on horseback after Clara Clayton to save her from falling to death in a ravine, is well renowned for its difficulty, with many players never able to get past it. And it is difficult to be sure for many reasons, but it's not impossible if you manage to avoid enough of the pitfalls and enemies in your way, while also collecting the various power-ups and bonuses available in the level. Well, I should say collecting the right power-ups and bonuses. And this is where the manual lets everyone down, and I almost wonder if the manual had done its job if maybe the game wouldn't have the brutally difficult reputation that it does. Eh, it probably still would. I mean, I did spend almost two hours trying to beat the first level in my first attempt to capture the footage for the review, and that was with already having experienced the Master System version. The issue here is that there's a few different power-ups that you can grab that appear in the level as floating boxes with various symbols in them, with of course the symbol indicating what the power-up does, as they can be things like giving you an extra chance if you fall off the horse, or potentially slowing down Claire's cart, making it easier to catch up to her. These power-ups aren't mentioned anywhere in the manual, so players would have no idea what any of them do. And as big as a goof as that is, believe it or not, that's not the largest problem. You see, because the level wasn't difficult enough as is, the devious minds at Probe decided to torture players even more by including two sets of power-ups, with some showing up in blue boxes and some showing up in green. Know the difference? Well, the blue power-ups are the good ones that you actually want to grab because they're helpful but the green ones do the opposite of what the blue ones do, making the level even more difficult. For instance, that power-up that slows down Clara's cart? Well, the green version makes it go faster, putting more distance between you and her. Thankfully, because I'd previously played the Master System version, and yes, it's not lost on me how odd it is to say that I'm thankful that I played that game, I knew this from playing that version, but anyone else would have been screwed. In all honesty, I, I don't mind the mechanic, but not explaining it to players is worse than screwing up the graphics, in my opinion. Alright, now that we've gotten through those technical missteps, let's dig into the game, starting with that infamous first level. And in what I'm sure is going to be a controversial opinion, I actually don't hate it? Uh, yes, it's hard. It's very hard and you're not beating it unless you know exactly what you're supposed to do where and keep mistakes to an absolute minimum. But honestly, it's not impossible. You really just have to memorize the level so you know what's coming and it can be done with enough practice. The developers likely realized how difficult the level was, and certain levels afterwards for that matter, and each time you fail the mission and have to start over, you'll get different text on the cutscenes to try to keep things interesting. Granted, after about the fourth time, you'll just be hitting buttons to skip them and get back in the game, but it was still a nice touch. Once you finally save Claire to get past the level, and yes, it can be done, I finally managed to do it myself without cheating, just with some cramped hands, it's off to level two, permanently. What I mean by that is, just like how you have infinite chances to complete the first level, once you've beaten it, you now get as many chances as you want to try the second level, and so on, without getting dumped back to the beginning of the game. Say what you will about the rest of the game, and it does deserve it, but this decision to allow players to try to progress as many times as they want without being punished for failing is the only thing that keeps the game playable. And it completely makes sense with the design of the game essentially being four separate mini-games rather than traditional levels. So, with the first level being a chase on horseback, what does the minigame for quote, level 2, unquote, involve? 
Well, would you believe a shooting gallery based on the town festival scene from the movie? If you played any type of shooting gallery in a video game, you should know what to expect here. Pro tip, and something that I didn't figure out until about my 10th attempt, you can just hold down on one of the buttons and Marty will constantly shoot. No rapid fire controller needed. And this is certainly a blessing due to what's needed to pass the level. What special requirement is that, you ask? Well, it's not that special, but just like how certain important information was left out of explaining details about the first level, there's some details lacking here as well. I'm pretty certain that what you have to do is score over 50,000 points in the level to pass and avoid Buford Tannen, but honestly, that's just a guess based on the score that I got when I finally passed it. Your guess is as good as mine, because again, it's not in the manual. It should be noted that the shooting gallery level wasn't included in the Master System port that I reviewed before, if you're familiar with that version of the game and are confused. Also, while we're discussing other versions of the game, questionably fun fact, the Amiga and Commodore 64 versions of the game include a vertically scrolling action level as their second level before going to the shooting gallery level, giving those versions of the game five levels instead of four just in case you want more Back to the Future 3. Also, seek help if that's the case, please. Alright, where was I? Uh, okay, yes, so for level 3 in this original version of the game, it's time for the Pie Fight level, which again takes some liberties with the source material and has Marty defending himself against the members of Tannen's gang before eventually having a showdown with Tannen himself, while only using Pie Tins to defend himself. While I don't mind the concept of the level that much, what I do mind is the horrendous control scheme, which finds you playing the level using isometric controls that simply don't work and are utterly confusing. While the first level is hard, at least the controls are clearly defined. Instead, this level ends up being hugely frustrating due to never quite knowing the direction that you're going to be throwing the pies in. Even after multiple, multiple attempts, I found that the best strategy was to move, attempt to throw, and if I wasn't throwing in the direction that I wanted to, move and then try again, hoping the gang member would still be on the screen to hit. The Master System version of this level, while still being tough, at least controlled better. On a personal note, it was at this point that I threw in the towel on the game. I'd played this terrible game for roughly four more hours than I should have, and after getting Buford Tannen down to one hit left with that terrible control scheme, I just couldn't take it anymore. I'm sure if I kept banging my head against the wall, I could get past it, having gotten that close, but unlike the first level, the poor controls just kill any kind of fun that you can have. Thankfully, for completion's sake, the game does feature a very easy to use level select code, so I pretended that I beat Buford so that we could move on with talking about the game's final level. For that fourth level, the game shifts into a platformer, with you again controlling Marty as the game reenacts the scene from late in the movie when Marty and Doc are attempting to push the DeLorean to 88 miles per hour via the Greyhound train. Essentially, you have to get from the back of the train to the DeLorean in the front, all while collecting eight special logs that will make the train's engine burn hotter and allow it to get up to the necessary speed, all while having to contend with enemies that get in your way and other environmental hazards that go along with trying to walk on a moving train. It's not a horrible idea for a level, but the execution is clearly off, and yet again I remember having a much easier time with the Master System version. Due to the time restriction of the level, it's similar to the first level in that you need to be very careful about how you proceed through, because one too many errors and you won't be able to make it to the DeLorean in time and have to start over. But unlike the first level, the controls are far more twitchy, and no one likes a platformer with poor controls. Again, the Master System version was the day here, not sure if it's because they learned from Probe's mistakes, or that the game is just simpler so that there's less opportunities to make a mistake. Eventually though, with enough practice, you'll make it to the DeLorean and get welcomed with a shot of Marty making his escape while one of the enduring messages from the movie is displayed at the bottom. And that's it. 
No credits, just right back to the Sega logo in case you're a complete head case and want to play it again. I've already mentioned the obvious graphical oops in the game, but what about the rest of the art that's used? Well, as you can tell from the video, it's certainly nothing special, and to add insult to injury, Back to the Future 3 only uses a 4 megabyte cartridge, so even if the developers wanted to do more with the game, they wouldn't have had room to. I don't think I'd specifically call the game ugly, well, maybe perhaps the pie fight level, that's pretty rough for a 16-bit title, and the level intro scenes, those are pretty rough. But if the rest of the game commits any particular graphical sin, it's just a general lack of detail. And considering the game as a whole screams budget title, I suppose that makes sense. The sound is just as blah and bland as the graphics. Again, most of the music is inoffensive, but that doesn't make it good in any way. The best thing that I can say about any of the sound in the game is that I could at least pick out the Ghost Riders in the Sky riff in the background music for the first level, but after playing that level for hours to get past it, the novelty quickly goes away. I do have sympathy for the developers of these licensed titles, as not all movies are going to make for good video games, without taking significant artistic license. So in those cases, they're stuck with either making a game that is really only associated with the film in name only, or they try to shoehorn certain sequences into a game that isn't really coherent at all, but at least resembles the movie. Probe took the latter approach here with Back to the Future 3, and between the game being a disjointed multi-genre mess, the off-putting difficulty of the first level, and yes, others for that matter, and throwing in some poor controls, it's just a garbage product and it's bad for even a budget title. Previously, I gave the Master System version a single star because as bad as a game as it was, it wasn't defective. But this? A major graphical issue that wasn't caught in testing in a manual that can't be bothered to properly explain an already difficult game. Yeah, I I've got no choice here. Extra level or no, this time around, Back to the Future 3 gets zero stars and is a certified complete bomb. Don't play this game. Don't buy this game, and if you must get your Marty McFly fix, just watch the damn movie. And that's it for Back to the Future 3. I think so far on the channel, this might be the most expensive, absolutely terrible game that I've played. Although I guess technically, if I had tried to source the original Brazilian version of Duke Nukem 3D, that would actually take that title, because that's really expensive. Either way, the price this game commands is exclusively due to scarcity, and I fully expect that scarcity to be a direct result of the quality of the game. It's the catch-22 of suck, pretty much. Next time on the channel, I'm not exactly sure what I'm reviewing, and I'm saying next time on the channel because I'm actually leaving town and going on a bit of a birthday trip, but one that hopefully will see me perhaps find a game or two that I still need for the collection. I could go ahead and choose what the next game is going to be, but I think I'm going to hold the spot open just in case I do find something interesting that costs less than a mortgage payment out in the wild. We'll see what I come back with, fingers crossed. Well, that's it for Zalgamoto episode 254. If you liked what you saw here and want to see more, please think about liking and subscribing if you're so inclined as it will help more people see these videos. But most importantly, whatever you like to play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later!